Shalom Chavri, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, the seven Noahide laws, universal morality, according to Chabad.org. And uh, anybody that knows about this subject, I think my wife really has stirred this subject up all over the planet. Uh, Everyone that you can possibly imagine has gotten into the seven Noahide laws. And in fact, I kind of wish we would have kept her, her broadcast up here on Israeli News Live. But like hers, ours will only be up for a short period of time. It will be then transferred over to Patreon uh, and even on our app website, uh, which, by the way, will be a website in the very near future as well. It'll be called 7 We already own that domain. It is what runs our app for Israeli News Live. So if you're looking for the app on the Android, Israeli News Live, just type it in. You'll be able to download the app there. It's supposed to be available on Apple products in the very near future as well, and we will be loading these types of videos there as well. So you have a choice, and the app's free. Uh, but we do appreciate those that support the ministry, and of course, Patreon is an excellent way to be able to support the ministry. It doesn't take much, as little as a dollar a month, uh, and your, your support there really helps us to be able to uh, create the content that we do. I don't want to waste time talking about that. Uh, and by the way, I've really been back into trying to finish the book, uh, What Have Rabbis Missed? It's going to have a lot of interesting information. Yana is going to be writing her first book, uh, and it's going to be about the Noahide laws. So I think that's going to be an interesting take as well. At least I hope she does. I know she's talked about it, but I'm hoping she will. Don't know for sure, but let's, let's hope so. Uh, at any rate there, uh, we're going to be getting into that from a biblical aspect. And if those of you that watched the Noon Institute, you saw me teach on Ephesians. Uh, and, and that's where we're going, but if you saw the one over on the Noon Institute, what you're going to find out today is going to make uh, the one I did on the Noon Institute look like skim milk compared to the one we're going to do today. We're going to go much deeper into this, and we're going to really lay the axe to the root of the tree, as John said, uh, for every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit must be hewn down and cast into the fire. Wow. We're going to also find out that when Yeshua was tempted by the Pharisees on marriage and divorce, they did it for a reason. And I think I know the answer to that. Now, it's not going to be a uh, license for sin by no means. So don't get me wrong when I get into this subject later. But I think I know now why they did what they did. Uh, let's go into this real quick, though. I want to start with... Uh, as Paul said, for my, uh, for finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, which is a Greek word that is derived from the beginning. So those principalities are, are the demonic beings that give power, the serpent himself from the very Garden of Eden, and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this world. Again, going all the way back to Genesis of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The only difference is, is we're going to find out that those principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness as we find in the book of Genesis there uh, and let me just jump to you there real quick in Genesis uh, that all this is manifest not only now but was also manifest in the days of Christ Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth now the earth was unformed and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters and I believe this is why Jesus walked on the waters on the Sea of Galilee to show that he was the same God that walked on the waters themselves back in Genesis. But it also says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. But if you'll notice, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Why? Because the darkness could not comprehend the light. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now it seems pretty ABC right here in Genesis, but it's much deeper than that, and that's what we're seeing over here. So, Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, what I did not realize at the time, and it was a, to me it was the providence of God that was, uh, that was guiding my hand, was when I brought up these scriptures, I was specifically looking for those principalities and powers. Where were they cross-referenced in the scripture? I had no idea that what Paul was saying that we would be fighting against and that we needed the full armor of God to fight against this, that he also had revealed who the principalities and powers actually were as far as manifested in the flesh. But you have to remember, although they were manifested in flesh, it was still not a flesh and blood battle. It was a spirit of the human being that was driving these people. And that's what we find in the book of Colossians chapter 2 specifically, verse 15, but I'll read from verse 14 here so we can get a look at all of it there. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That is, by the way, those ordinances that were blotted out happened to be the oral law, okay? And having Spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Wow. So Christ, he spoiled the principalities and powers when he showed them, show, uh, made a show of them openly. How did he manage to make a show of them openly? Well, it's very simple. All you had to do is look and see what Jesus began to say about them. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the councils in the synagogue, and you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Ah, wow. That's getting interesting. In fact, we could go, well, let's just jump, we'll jump further in uh, what I planned on right now. Like, for example, he says right here, uh, back up, and we're over here in Matthew 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchre of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witness unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets, fill you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Well, talk about Colossians saying that he, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Yeah, he made a spoil of them, all right. He told you right who their daddy was. They were a generation of serpents. In fact, if you read the Hebrew, Matthew, that the Jewish, uh, our Jewish friends, which I am a descendant of the Jewish people as well, were so kind to preserve, he said they were seed of vipers. Hmm. That gets interesting, doesn't it? If you go a little further down in Colossians to verse 21, isn't it interesting? It says here, And not holding the head from which the body by the joints and bands having nourishment ministered and, and knit together increased with the increase of God, where... For if you, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are perished with the using after the commandments of the doctrines of men. That's exactly right. Now, isn't it interesting? If you take and you go to Chabad.org, they talk about the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jewish factions during the Hasmonean period, and they state here, all right, we'll kind of highlight this for you. See where you see where we're going to read at here. There were four primary groups, Jews during much of the Second Temple period era, Pharisees, Sadducees, Amichaaretz, and Essenes. The Pharisees known as the Prashim or the Chavrim. Uh, I don't know why they call them Chavrim because Prashim. In other words, they were the separated ones, right? consisted of the sages and the vast majority of the Jewish people who were loyal to the Torah and followed the sages. This group was called the Purushim, which means separate because they were careful not to come in contact with people who may not have been ritually pure. <laughs> oh my gosh. They may not have been ritually pure, right? That's interesting. Because if you think about it, 
They weren't ritually pure. Well, what did he say right here? Paul said, touch not, taste not, handle not. Don't touch me. Don't come near me. Uh, you're unclean. <laughs> yeah, that describes the Pharisees to a T. And by the way, it is believed very much so that the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago are what gave rise to, to modern-day Judaism. In fact, it is the, the descendants of the Pharisees that wrote the Midrash. And much of the Talmudic writings are from the Pharisaic line, which many rabbinical teachers today say that the Jews of today are descendants of the Pharisees. In fact, Rambam's teaching... Uh, in the Mishnah, actually I should say the Mishnah, not the, well the Midrash as well, because the Midrash is Rashi's writings, but uh, we have here the seven Noahide laws come from Rambam's teaching there, part of the Pharisaic uh, law uh, that comes down. What are the seven Noahide laws? Seven Noahide laws are, are rules that, are all, uh, that all of us must keep regardless of who we are, from where we come, without these seven things, it would be impossible for humanity to live together in harmony. That's the New World Order laws. Just remember what Jesus said to you, right? I think that we can find a good, a good one here in Luke on that. And, they, and, when they, and, and this is much like Matthew 24, for those of you that, that go into the final day uh, showdown. Ma, uh, Matthew 24, so Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and into the magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Well, now you know that the magistrates, which by the word, the word magistrates used here in Luke is the exact same word that is used in Ephesians here for principalities. They just translate it magistrates over here in the, uh, from Greek to English, the magistrates and powers. So you could say unto principalities and powers. But thank God that Jesus, having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly who they actually are. Right? So let's take a look also at Mark. Mark also addresses the issue in chapter 13, verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the councils. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. What do you know? No wonder why Paul said, pull on the full armor of God, because you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. And the thing is, it's the Pharisees. What I don't get though is why is the Christian world cheerleading all this group here? I mean, come on, face it, friends. What do we got here? We've got the cheerleaders right here. This is from uh, ch uh, churchleaders.com. They should call them cheerleaders.com. Churchleaders.com. You can now buy a $45 Trump as Cyrus coin. Yeah, the proceeds go for the building of the third temple and also for the buying of the animals for the animal sacrificial service. You will put Christ to an open shame by supporting the sacrificial system in a third temple. That is a complete rejection of Christ for his blood sacrifice that he gave for your sins and you're going to take and start buying Trump coins that support that very ideology? What has happened to Christianity? And it's everywhere, right? Not only that, you got Nikki Haley. Israeli group honors Nikki Haley. Now you can get your own Nikki Haley coin. And people say Nikki Haley is a, is a good evangelical Christian. I'm not saying that she's not. You know? And I realize Nikki Haley has really tried to stand up for Israel. I appreciate that. But the Sanhedrin is wanting her to be an honorary member of the Sanhedrin, of the, which is the rabbis that will sit in judgment of the world. The problem is, is the Christians, as it says in the book of Revelation, you're blind, naked. Let, let's just pull it, let's pull it up. Revelation. 
You know, we, can, we can't go by without no, noticing these things. Friends, I mean, how, how, how are we going to stand before God? I forget exactly where that's at. I think it's in the, is it the third chapter, I believe. See? You're blind, naked, miserable, wretched, don't even know it. See, the Spirit saith unto the churches, that's Philadelphia. We're talking about the Laodicean church. And by, by the way, I believe that all those seven churches are represented in every single age. I did a video on this a good while back. Uh, if you look it up there, the seven churches uh, is, I don't remember the name of the video, but I did a video on this and I showed that the Spirit, you can find it in all the churches of today. So he says unto the angel of the church of the last scenes, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Yeah, because you can't make up your mind. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. You know, that's terrible. What a condition the, the church has got to. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That's a slap in the face. You Christians that are out there buying the gold trump coins. And God says to you, I counsel you to buy of me gold. But no, you're out there buying trump coins instead. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes, saith, that thou mayest see. But instead you're caught up into this nonsense. What a shame. Can you, can you imagine that? That Christ said that to John the Revelator all those years ago, knowing that the time would come, people would be buying up gold trump coins and everything. And, and the sad thing is, people are doing it and people are selling it. And I don't think half of them realize what they're doing. God knows your heart. God knows maybe you didn't mean it. But I'd get away from it. Because he said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, I guarantee you one thing. Them coins ain't tried in the fire. The fire of the trials and temptations that you're going to have to go through. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase as be zealous therefore and repent. My gosh. See, what does he say there? You're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Powers. The same people you're buying this coin for, for the Sanhedrin, who's put this thing, you know the Sanhedrin held sponsored? They're wanting to rule the world. They say that judgment is going to go forth from Jerusalem. They're going to take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. Let's go ahead and deal with that one as well. i got to pull that up. I forget exactly where that's at. Let's just put it in here. All right, the skirt. Of him that is a Jew, right? Zechariah 8.23. That's exactly what I, I, I couldn't remember, but let's go ahead and go to it because I just, I heard Rabbi Tovia Singer quote this the other day. I was listening to a video of his and I'm like, I could not believe that Tovia Singer of all people, you know, I expect it because he's, he's a Jewish rabbi, but he should, he knows what the scripture says in the Hebrew language and then to, to sit there and quote it the way he did He's just like some of those other ones out there. They cannot, for the life of them, quote the scripture correctly. All right, here we go, right here. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. Ten men. Why ten? Because when Abraham asked God, if there be ten righteous, would you spare the city for the sake of ten? God said, if I can find ten, I'll spare for the sake of the ten. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? So ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nation, shall even take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. Singular. All right? And for those that don't understand Hebrew, I will show you plain as day. All right, let me just keep it only highlighted what we need to focus on. Because see that what's going to happen 
is all these other rabbis, including uh, Yitzhak Shapira, they're going to tell you, oh, notice right here, Imchem, Imchem, Lemor, Nelecha, uh, excuse me, Nelecha, Imchem, we, uh, saying, we, we will go with you. Kishamanu, because we have heard Elohim Imchem, because we have heard that God is with you, plural. And they focus on that. The plural, right here, God is with you, plural. And so they're going to say, they're taking a hold of the seat of the Jews, plural, right? Well, it's not taking the hold of a seat of the Jews, plural, to begin with. It is a singular, Ish, Yehudi, a Jewish man, one Jewish man, and they take a hold of, not a tzitzit, okay, vehi zeku bekanaf ish Yehudi, they take a hold of the wing of a Jewish man, a wing, his sleeve, his arm, whatever you want to call it, all right? And then when they take a hold of that Jewish man, the ten people of the nation, of all the nations, take a hold of that one guy, then they say, we hear God is with you. Why? Because that one Jewish man fulfilled the scripture when God wanted to come down in the sight of all of Israel. Back in the times of Moses when the trumpet was sounding and God says, get the people ready for the third day. I will come down. I will make myself known among them. And then they will know to fear because I have shown that I speak with you face to face. Right? I'm just paraphrasing that part. And they feared. They said, no, now let God not speak. Let Moses speak lest we die. Okay, God said, all right, I'll raise up a prophet like unto you, Moses. When Christ came, that Jewish man, Ish Yehudi, because he was from the tribe of Judah, when he came on the earth, he was the prophet likened unto Moses. He was the Mashiach ben David. He was the Mashiach Nagid, spoken by Daniel the prophet. And when he came, the scripture says that they took a hold. It's written in the Hebrew Matthew. I don't have time to pull it up right now, but they took a hold. When they were up in Syria even, there were people from Syria coming and they took a hold of Bekanaf. They took a hold of his wing. But the true fulfillment, and I'll show you this one here, the true fulfillment is in the book of, excuse me, in the book of Acts. All right, Acts 238 is where we commonly would think of, but let me just pull this up real quick for you guys so we don't miss out on this. All right, so in the second chapter, okay, and I'll drop it down to verse 38 to make it a little faster here. All right, but before we read 38, right, uh, let's see, therefore being right hand, okay. Okay, when they were coming out, they, they were, the 120 were in the upper room. They came out, they're staggering around like a bunch of drunk men. All right. All right, now, got to find the one spot in there because it talks about they had came from all the world, everywhere. All right, okay. You, okay, here we go. All right. Uh... Okay, Crete's. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here it is right here. Okay, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men of every nation under heaven. All right, devout men of every nation under heaven. There's your ten men. Like I said, it comes from that if there be ten righteous of Abraham. That's where that idea of the ten of the, of the nation. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans, and here and now hear we every man, how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. Perithians, Medes, Elamites, and they go through the different names, right? Including, watch this, Jews and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes, Jew and Gentile from all the known nations at the time were there in Jerusalem. And what did they do? 
This is when they heard that God was with them. This is when they said, men and brethren, what must we do to receive the Holy Spirit? And that's when Peter stood up in the midst of them in verse 38 and he says, all right, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That was the fulfillment of it. You know, they all sitting there running around quoting Zechariah like there's some kind of great holy revival going to come from a bunch of Pharisees that are descendants of, of, uh, of a Nephilim racehood. Now, not all Pharisees were descendants like that. But I, now just a conjecture, I believe it was through the Maccabees is where these children come from. That's just my thought there. I can't say so, but the Maccabees overthrew the true priesthood, the true Zedekite priest. And they got involved, they got in power there, right? But just remember, again, we'll go back to it. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness. He also says in Colossians, speaking about Jesus Christ, that he spoiled the principalities and powers and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. All right? Now, what are they wanting to do in modern days, just like the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago? They're wanting to bring about the seven Noahide laws. All right? Do not profane God's oneness. They look like similar to the Ten Commandments, but these are found only in the Talmud, not in the Bible. I'd just soon keep the Ten Commandments myself. Do not curse your Creator, which, by the way, according to Rambam, where these were taken from, from the... Uh, from the Mishnah, he says they'll be, they will behead you for breaking these laws. Do not murder. Which That's a Ten Commandment law right there. The problem is, though, in the seven Noahide laws, it's all those sub-laws that are Talmudic laws that define what these laws mean, such as Christians that worship Jesus Christ as the divine Son of God. Beheading for you guys. See? Do not eat the limb of a living animal. Do not steal. Harness the, the channel of the human libido. That's interesting. They want you to harness and channel the human libido, but they sure couldn't do it themselves, could they? No, not at all. In fact, let me show you why they couldn't do it. Right there in Ezra. Now, Ezra, they were all about building the, the, the second temple. It's interesting. Uh, Cyrus and Darius, Artaxerxes, all these... Uh, Babylonian leaders had given different decrees about building the, the second temple and reviving it. Ezra and a lot of the other uh, men of Israel, they were excited, they were ready to go home, they wanted to rebuild the temple. And after everything had been done, eight chapters gone by, we get to the ninth chapter, and suddenly we hear this here. Now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes, princes and rulers have been first, first in this faithlessness. What do you know? Now when he heard that, he tore his garments. He was weeping and repenting. All you priests and Levites, do you realize what these people had done back then? You know, the whole thing was God had commanded. When God was given, Moses was given a commandment through Moses, like for example, and thou shalt not approach to a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is impure by her uncleanness. And thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. But here is the big one. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed to set them apart to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. That was a sexual sin to pass your children through the fire to Molech. They did it anyway. Remember Enoch? Not Enoch. Please don't get that wrong. I have to say it all the time because everybody gets it mixed, mixed up, right? Let's look at that one too. We might as well get it all out in the open while we're here, right? Enoch. 
All right, and Nephilim. I, I think I know where that's at. Uh, it's not going to come up that way. There it is. Let me think. Is it Deuteronomy? or No, Numbers, I believe it is. Let's just quickly go there because we need to cover all the bases. Because, you know, I can say it, and you say it, and the people won't get it as easily as if you show it. All right, so Numbers, chapter 13, last verse. Right? Now, this is when Joshua and Caleb had gone to spy out the land with the other eight spies, a total of ten spies, and they, and, and the, the, uh, but when the men went up into the hill and said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. That's the eight spies. And they spread an evil report in the land which they had spied out into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Cannibalism. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Yeah. And there was the Nephilim. They were sons of Anak. A-N-A-K. Who came of the Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. The Nephilim. The fallen angels had produced children. And this was in those lands where the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, right? Here they are, all up here in this same chapter here, because God told them, don't do like they do. When you go into the land, you're to kill them and, and destroy them. You're not to intermingle your seed among them. But if you remember the story of Joshua, they ended up not killing them all. And they ended up dwelling in amongst them. And so when Israel went into captivity into Babylon, so did the Canaanite, Amorite, Perizzite, Jebusite. And while they were over in Babylon, they ended up married. The priests and the Levites ended up taking these women for their wives and having children by them. And now we have a bunch of Nephilim priests. Now Ezra told them to separate from these people of the land, which I'm sure many of them did. But the problem is, then the Maccabees come along, and according to the, to the uh, Orthodox Jews of today, they say that the Maccabees were Le Le Levitical priest line. Well, then why does the scripture, why does it say they overthrew the priest? I believe, just a conjecture, but I believe that they were the sons of those Canaanite Hittite, Amorite women. Remember when the scripture says the Amorite, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full? God was waiting for that Amorite sin to come to a full blown power. The principalities and powers, the very one that Jesus did what? He spoiled the principalities and powers and made a show of them openly who they really were. Yeah, that's when he comes over here and he starts telling you what they really are. See? Now watch, they, watch this, it's interesting. If you look at the book of Luke chapter 20 verse 20, and they watched him, speaking about Jesus, they watched Jesus, and sent for spies which should feign themselves just men, that they might take a hold of his words, that so they might deliver him under the power and authority of the governor. Huh. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither accept thou the person of any man of any but teachest the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and saith unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny, and whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. He said unto them, Render therefore Caesar's the things that which are Caesar's, and to God the things which be God's. That wasn't the only thing that they were trying to, to, to catch him in. You know, another one they were working on. Let me see if I can find it here. I've got to find the right ones here. Oh, by the way, here's the other one too. This is not the one I was thinking about. Luke chapter 12, verse 11. And who's, start verse 10. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you into the synagogues and into the magistrates and powers and take you no thought how that what you shall say uh, shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour. What synagogues, what magistrates, what 
principalities. That's going to be today in modern days. That's going to be those seven Noahide law systems, those courts of justice that they're preparing for you. That's what they're going to take you to. All right. Now, again, let me find this real quick here. All right. So Ezra, we know what Ezra did, right? Now, again, in uh, where are we at here? We are in the book. Okay, yeah, this was Leviticus chapter 18. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed to set them apart to Molech. Now, I want to take you. This is the Hebrew Matthew chapter 19. Now, I specifically want to use this one. You can read it in the King James. It's perfectly fine. It's, it's worded nearly the same. Just seems to have a very interesting way of wording it here. And that's why I wanted to use the Hebrew Matthew for this right here to share with you. Now, this is, again, a conjecture. But I think it's very notable to bring up, especially in light of what was going on in the days that Yeshua was here. And it came to pass when Jesus finished these words, he passed from Galilee and, and came to the outskirts of the land of Judah across the Jordan. There followed him large crowds and he healed, healed them. Then the Pharisees came to him to tempt him. Now watch this. They asked him saying, is it permissible for one to leave his wife for any matter and to give her a bill of divorce. He answered them, Have you not read that he that who made them of old made male and female, he created them? He said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. If so, they are not two, but one flesh. And whatever the Creator has joined together, man is unable to separate. They said to him, If so, why did Moses command to give her a bill of divorce and to send her away from his house? He said to them, Moses, because of the obstinacy, or the hardness, that is, of your heart, said you to leave your wives, but from eternity it was not so. I say to you that everyone who leaves his wife and takes another, if not for adultery, commits adultery. And he who takes her, who has been divorced, commits adultery. Now, what I'm going to say here is not for you to justify sin or anything like that. Because I believe very strongly about marriage and divorce. I believe the writings of Paul are very important when it comes to marriage and divorce. Right? But on this particular occasion, and I never caught this before, but if you go back to Ezra and you realize what they did, they had married in amongst these women. And then Ezra tells them to separate from these wives and including the children to put them away because of the sin that they had brought into Israel. I wonder when they were tempting Jesus about the laws of marriage and divorce, it's because they were the children that were resulted of those marriages. All right? Now we know the only way, here's the whole thing, they had to have been the children because Jesus said that they, they were of their father, the devil, and his works they would do. Now, they do argue the case. They said, we be of Abraham's seed. And Jesus didn't deny the fact they're of Abraham's seed, but they're of Abraham's seed through their mothers. And I think this is why Israel in modern times makes you Jewish according to your mother, not according to your father, the way it was done in biblical times. Why? Because they know as a result of those mixed marriages up in Babylon, they were not Jews based on their father's, but they were Jews based on their mothers only. Fascinating. So if you look at it again, the Pharisees came to him to tempt him. They asked him, verse 3 is where I'm at, saying, is it permissible for one to leave his wife for any matter and to give her a bill of divorce? All right. They're trying to find out if what their fathers did was okay. He answered them, Have you not read that he who made them of old male and female, he created them? Why does Jesus go back to the creation at the beginning on this issue? Because in the beginning there was no fall. 
In the beginning, we did not have the situation where the fallen angels had came down and cohabitated with the women on the earth. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, He made them male and female. There had not been one single sin as of yet. As I said, there was no fallen angels tricking these women to make them think that they're their husbands and therefore going into them and them conceiving and bringing forth the Nephilim. That sin is not on them. The sin is on those fallen angels. That's why there's no mercy for them nor their children. All right? So, he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. If so, they are now not two, but one flesh. Whatsoever the Creator has joined together, man is unable to separate. They said to him, if so, why did Moses command to give her a bill of divorce and to send her away from his house? He said to them, Moses, because of the obstinacy of your heart, said to leave your wives. But from eternity it was not so. So there's something else going on. Why they asked the question and the why he answered the way he did. That's my thought on it. He said to them, Moses, because, okay, I say to you uh, that everyone who leaves his wife and takes another, if not for adultery, commits adultery. They committed adultery anyway. And so therefore, it was a sin to begin with to marry these women because God had already commanded, do not give your seed unto these people. Because of all the idolatry and, and, and soothsaying and wickedness and, and intermingling with the Nephilim that they were doing, he said, don't do it. Now, like I said, don't take this and apply it only to that and say, oh, it's okay for us to do what we want in marriage and divorce. No, it's not. You stay with your wife. You love her. It's Christ loved the church as well. You know, it's kind of interesting because if you look at this also when Paul speaks about the man as the head of the woman, or Christ the head of the church and the man as the head of the woman, the word in Greek is kephale, which means source. And there again, it also bears record of the same thing. He's showing you that there is a source. That, that might go over some people's heads, and I don't want to get you really confused on this, but I want to just throw that in there. It's just amazing to me when I saw that, right? All right, now, let's see where are we at now. Now, again, if we look back at Colossians, he spoiled those principalities and powers when he, when he showed of them openly, triumphing over them. Right? Now here's a good example of where he triumphed over them. This is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. There again, exposing who Satan was in the days he was 2,000 years ago. Right? Also, ah, uh, all right, we already know. That, that's really important here. We go to uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 9. Take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. That's coming, friends. We are headed to that same day once again. Again, now I don't know how many scriptures I may have missed here in trying to bring all this out to you. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, let me just share this with you as well. John chapter 8, verse 44, the Gospel of John. You are, Jesus said about the Pharisees and Sadducees, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar. And the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered they, answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have no devil, but I honor my father, and you do, do dishonor me. I see, I, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. All right? Of course, they try to challenge him on that statement as well. 
And also over in Matthew, again, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's exposing them of who they really were. And I've gone through this many times before. Woe to you, scribes, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not have been partakers of them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? My gosh, it just... It goes on and on and on and on. There's just no end to it, guys. No end to it at all. All these amazing insights here. Um, let's see. Hmm. You know, one thing that's interesting. I'll just read this. this is Matthew 24. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Right now, they're, you know, Israel today, the modern state of Israel, is behind all these wars in the Middle East, all these displacement of the nations, and they're going to be behind the war that will come to our nation as well. They'll be behind the wars that are going on in Venezuela right now and in all the things that are happening in South America. They will be behind the war that will hit Russia, and they will eventually use communist China to rule in and help reign over the nations and they will introduce communism once again as it was done in Russia and the former Soviet Union. That's why we see when Jesus says, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there should be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. For those people, they are sorrows. It's coming to our nation, it's going to be sorrows as well. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Yeah? Because the seven Noahide laws, Jesus is out. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. They're already doing it. In the name of Christianity, they're telling you to go back under Judaism. You have sinned. You have done wrong, especially those Spanish Jews. They're trying to get you all back underneath the Talmudic Jews of 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees of today. And Jesus has already exposed to you that they are the principalities and they are the powers. And he triumphed over them and he showed you, showed who they were openly. Now the thing is, I'm trying to get your attention to that so you realize what we're dealing with here in modern days. All right, now let's go back to Matthew. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Not what they're going to bring to you. You're two witnesses. And I guarantee you one thing. It won't be coming out of Jerusalem. Those two witnesses will rise up on the scene. Maybe they're already speaking to you and you just don't know it. I'll close for now. Friends, listen. Thank you for supporting the broadcast here. We can't do this without you. Whether you're giving via our address right here below the screen or online, your help is vital. The preparations for when they take us down here are being made. Our 7 org website that will be up here hopefully in the next few months will also be hosting many of the videos. IsraeliNewsLive.org, as long as it's up, it will also continue to have videos there, but we are working on backup plans. We also will be having a mailing plan as well. That one will be far more secretive though, kind of like the underground newspapers in the old days. Just remember, we'll find a way to stay in touch with you. Those that support the ministry, we have your addresses. We're working on putting those in a database. God bless you. Thank you. And Shalom in this world of Ain Shalom.